Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could teach the gullible to never be so comfortable with eyes they eat like comfort food? To disregard the bogus claims and pseudo-scientific claims? Can you imagine just how much indeed the world would change? No more political predators playing on the populace with ilkus and plots to shift and kill metropolis. No more villains with the title in the Bible holding phony temper rifles like the stuff they teach is vital. Imagine it was no one left to prove a claim to make. The folks really feel ashamed of expressing content that was fake. It's not to say we never make mistakes. It's just to say we go out of our way to show the evidence it takes. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or even stay trapped. We're allowed to get fast. That's what it is, yo. Yeah. Keep reality intact. Yeah. Help the truth. I don't question every claim, especially the ones you believe in. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or reason. Hi, I'm Rob Penzak, a physician turned writer, the founder of Saved by Science and executive director of Atheist Alliance of America. Um, today I am joined by a friend from Richmond, Jason Gregory, who got thrown under the bus and thrown into this about 20 minutes ago on the car ride over with his wife Munaza. So if you think Eve was the only one to uh, get after men, you're wrong. Jason, can you um, tell us a little bit about kind of your background, how you got into atheism, um, and a little bit about your wedding? Sure. Uh, I was born and raised a Catholic. Um, about uh, college into high school, um, I started studying the Bible a little more. Uh, I didn't really know what it said before. I just knew what my parents told me and what Sunday school told me. Uh, the more I read it, the more uh, disgusted I became with it, especially the Old Testament. Uh, so I kind of had this gradation where I came away from Catholicism and I just said, well, I'm a Christian, but nobody really knows the truth but you know Jesus did good things and you know I felt good mm -hmm. doing good things and then eventually I left Christianity I became uh, spiritual but not religious and then eventually I saw the light and I became an athe atheist. <laughs> and you did some activism before moving to Richmond right? Correct. Uh, I was with the secular humanist of the Low Country in Charleston, South Carolina. A lot of people may know Herb Silverman right. or Amy Munsky. Mm -hmm. uh, so I worked with them on the board for a few years and I also volunteered one year for uh, Camp Quest, South Carolina, cool. which was a great experience. Right, I guess one of your claims to fame is that your wedding was officiated by Herb Silverman, you said. Yes, yes, and so far I guess uh, no one has divorced yet, Herb that's said. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's good news. So um, today, you know, today is the 15 year anniversary of 9-11 um, and we're going to be talking with some mutual friends with Sarah Hader and Mohammed Sayed, who are two of the co-founders of Ex-Muslims of North America, to talk about you know, what's changed in the last 15 years, what's gotten better, what's gotten worse, and what's just stagnated. Um, how did you and Manaza get to, to know these guys? Uh, we met them through the ex-Muslims of North America. Uh, my wife uh, interviewed to become part of the group and uh, I met them on an outing one time and uh, we've been friends since. Excellent. Okay, um, so we're going to get back to that, uh, bring those guys on in about 10 minutes or so. Do you want to, why don't you start us off, you've got a news story there about Mother Teresa? Yes, uh, so um, she was, uh, became a saint, uh, you know, after her death. Uh, John Paul II in the 20th century lowered the requirement from three miracles to two. Uh, so if there's anybody out there that has two and you didn't hear the news, congratulations, you've been a saint the whole time. That's right. Well, no, you got to <laughs> visit us on our Facebook page. You let us know your two miracles and we'll try to get you hooked up towards sainthood. And uh, apparently uh, one of her miracles, um, the patient, uh, received medical uh, intervention mm -hmm. and got better afterwards so it's a little dubious at best. Right, I guess her tumor turned out to be a tubercular cyst and she received you know, medications for tuberculosis so it was a medical miracle or scientific miracle um, and, and nonetheless there she is being a saint um, and, and I'd like to I guess just talk about the silliness of how this whole organization is basing all this on miracles and lowering the number from three to two as if they've ever had a verifiable miracle. Um, <laughs> And apparently he generated more saints uh, than anybody, uh, than everybody before him put together just mm -hmm. because of that requirement drop down. Yeah, and then, and then just the ethics that, uh, you said you had read Christopher Hitchens' book, but just the, the idea that Mother Teresa, who was you know, a champion of, of poverty and suffering, not of the impoverished masses and suffering masses, the ethics of making her a saint for any organization, you know, you don't, it's just, uh, it's hard for us to fathom, I guess, in the secular community. Yes, yeah, so there's a quote from Hitchens that said, uh, criticized her for not the honest relief of suffering, but the promulgation of a cult based on death and suffering and sub subjection. 
She also uh, was criticized for where she received some funds from Keaton from financial scandals, and also she defended him, I believe, mm -hmm. in court to help get a lower sentence. Yeah, I grew up in Arizona for a while, and so the Keating Five took place, uh, you know, back there. And, and yes, again, I guess when money comes into play, ethics can go out the window and religion is quick to look past that. Um, the second news article I just wanted to mention was in the New York Times, Why Facts Don't Unify Us. And this is according to a, a new Pew Research uh, poll, just showing that our nation is more polarized than it's ever been before. Um, and so if you, this you know, plays into just confirmation bias, that if you take something even very scientific, where it shouldn't just be based on your ideology, like climate change, and you have a, a set of people that already mostly understand it and believe it, and other people that are skeptics, um, and you present them with information that supports whatever their position is, they're really quick to take it, and if you present them with disconfirming evidence, they're quick to ignore it. Um, and so, you know, so they go through some data on that, and the important point they make is that this extends into everything. And so you know, right now we have Trump and Clinton saying lots and lots of things, and so you're going to just tend to believe whatever you already believe. Um, you know, what does that do to our national discourse? Yeah, I can see how that divides people. They just dig in deeper to what they already held before. Yeah. So, all right, let me go through a couple of uh, announcements here. Uh, upcoming show on October 9th for Rotary's, and Sarah Levin, who's a former host here, is now the Senior Legislative Representative at Secular Coalition of America. She's going to be joining me to um, interview Larry Decker, who's their new Executive Director for since uh, December. On November 20th, David Tamayo and I are going to be chatting with Mark Gura, who's the Vice President of Atheist Alliance of America, talking about atheist Buddhism. On December, December 11th, uh, Aaron Ra is going to join us. He's the President of Atheist Alliance of America. Uh, he has an excellent new book, Foundational Falsehoods of Creationism. He has a, a wonderful seri uh, video series, too, if you check out on YouTube. He's you know, a great educator. Um, this is really good video and a good book, both for people that already are somewhat aware with this information and for people that are new to it. So it's, you know, looking forward to all those shows. And then on January 8th, Roy Speckhardt, the Executive Director of American Humanist Association, is going to be joining us. Um, so let me just check and see how we're doing right now. All right, so a couple of other things. I also run Save by Science as a program in Richmond. Um, we're going to be having on October 2nd, there's Dream On is something that, uh, it's a documentary that kind of shows people retracing the steps that, steps that Alexis de Tocqueville took when he first thought of America, you know, what an egalitarian place it was, the land of opportunity. So Dream On is their documentary to see if that American dream is still alive or just a joke. Um, we're going to be doing a, sc a screening this Tuesday. Um, if you're in Richmond, if you check out Save by Science, I'll have some information where you're welcome to come join us for a screening. Um, and then to, on October 2nd, to hear the director and the political satirist actor um, you know, discuss why they did this, where things stand right now. On November 6th, again, if you're anywhere in the Richmond area, we're going to have Gavin Schmidt, who's the director of the NASA Goddard uh, Institute for Space, Study, Space Studies, and um, Bob Brinkman, who's a Canadian rap artist that just finished an off-Broadway production uh, rap guide to Climate Chaos, probably mangled that name. Those two guys are going to join us for a great talk on global warming. So that's some of the stuff that we have going on in Richmond. Uh, look on Save by Science if you want more information about those. We usually do a person of the week and a joke of the week. Um, with 9-11, it didn't seem very appropriate to be doing a joke of the week. So we're going to bundle these two together. Um, and so the joke isn't really much of a joke at all. It's science flies you to the moon, religion flies you into buildings. Um, the person that coined that phrase as our person of the week was Victor Stenger. He's a particle physicist, philosopher, author, uh, and skeptic who died a couple of years ago. He's one of the few people that puts himself at a seven on the Richard Dawkins scale, you know, belief and non-belief, saying that as a scientist, for the God as depicted in any of the holy books you, you know, want to put before him, he has plenty of positive evidence to say that that God doesn't exist. If you want to redefine God as, as love or nature or beauty, you know, now you're playing a, a game of semantics. Um, but you know, he, he's made a very lasting contribution. He also said the universe is not fine to tu is not fine tuned for us. We're fine tuned for the universe. People that don't understand evolution often get confused about that. Um, but anyway, so that's our person of the week, joke of the week. Um, and I think we're going to go to a public service announcement um, a little bit early, just so we can get Sarah Muhammad in here. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about. So thank you, and we'll see you back in a couple minutes. Thanks. One of the goals of an atheist community is to provide support for those who find themselves without faith in light of mounting evidence against unfounded beliefs. 
Organizations with this goal range from skeptic groups to humanist service meetups to support groups for those who may have lost a community through their deconversion. In response to this, Recovering from Religion, an organization that seeks to support those who have left their faith, has recently launched the Hotline Project. This is not a deconversion hotline. The motive behind the project is to support a growing population of people who have left their faith and need to construct their identities around a new, beautiful reality. If you want more information, you can visit the Recovering from Religion website at recoveringfromreligion.org. Mm -hmm. Homemade noodles. Oh. Marty, stop it! Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. It reminds me. I've been thinking, uh, maybe we should try a new form of birth control. I heard about this one, it's called the IUD, intrauterine device. Or we could try the patch on your arm. Actually, I think that one goes on your butt. Bedsider.org has birth control information and a lot more. And it's... What do you think, then? Arm or the butt? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably put the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. Each week, the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience, and the harm they cause with a combination of facts, humor, and community involvement. They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube. And remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. Or well, there'll be hell to pay. Okay, we are back with Sarah Hader and Mohammed Saeed. I'm two of the co-founders of Ex-Muslims of North America. Thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you for here. inviting us. Um, so this is the 15-year anniversary for 9-11, <clears throat> and we're going to spend most of the program sort of discussing where we've come since that point. Uh, but first, if you guys can just tell us, you know, tell us a little bit about your foundation for anybody that doesn't know about it, and what are some of the things that you're focusing on right now? So, uh, generally speaking, the issue that we encountered a few years ago was that uh, there are lots of uh, explosions out there that are isolated and people are afraid of the consequences and they don't interact with other people and we wanted to change that. This is the 21st century and if there's anybody that believes there's only one about anything, that's slightly insane. So we started uh, having meetups in various cities around the country, starting in DC. We're in about 18 cities right now and we manage communities of ex-Muslims that um, help each other out. We've had cases where people have had to run away, where other people gave them shelter, um, where people have uh, moved in together, roommates, and we have people that have gotten married, and lots of very interesting, wonderful things have come out of it. Um, and Sarah, you had mentioned before the show that the internet is sort of a double-edged sword with some, some problems in how Islamists can use it, but also very helpful. Can you talk about how, it's, how your group has worked with that, you know, some, some of the upside and then some of the downside? Well, I really think that without the internet, a group like ours just could not exist. Um, it would be completely impossible because of how dangerous it is to be an open apostate. Many people are not willing to be open at all. And the internet is how we've been able to find each other, to gain trust without having to you know, meet in person first, and then uh, to slowly move forward to making live um, communities where people actually meet up. Uh, so I think that without, without the internet, this just it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to organize on a mass level like we've been able to. And if there's any people out there watching that are you know, Muslims that no longer believe, how do they go about approaching you? And what do you guys do to make sure it's all legitimate? So we have a website. It's um, www.exmna.org. And over there you can find a way to join us and you set up uh, a meeting to talk to one of us. And we have a, a screening process for everyone that wants to join. And it's not a science, it's an art. But we try and do, we, we do what we can to make sure that everyone's safe and comfortable before they join the communities. 
Okay. All right, so now I'm going to jump toward 9-11. 9-11 obviously was not the beginning of terrorism, but for a lot of Americans, that's sort of when it first came on their radar. Mohammed, you were saying when we talked um, before, you would place it at a different point. Where, where do you think we should start thinking about modern terrorism? Um, so the word modern is very important to distinguish that because this has existed since the beginning of Islam, I would say. Um, but uh, due to colonialism and the fact that most Muslim countries lost their independence and um, military dominance of the West, uh, Muslims largely had lost confidence and they weren't willing to stand up. They didn't believe that they could. And due to the war in Afghanistan and the, the Soviet, Pakistani, US uh, alliance defeating Russia, um, that gave a lot of people confidence that they could actually stand up. If we could defeat Soviet Russia, we can do anything. And a lot of uh, the fighters that were a part of that war then went out to various parts of the world and started insurgencies and uh, tried to bring Islam everywhere they could. Okay. Um, is there anything, any kind of international things going on right now that tie very directly to Islam that we in America should be more aware of as we try to get a, a feel for where our big risks are coming from? Sorry, can you? It's just like what I think in America, it's very easy that we stay very focused on our own problems, and America does not tend to have a very good awareness of what's going on in other countries, whether it's Syria, Iraq, Iran. Are, are there any? Any, any insights that you guys can share that, that you guys think about in terms of you know, threats to security that, that we should maybe be more aware of? So one of the things is a very broad-based thing. Often we look, try to focus on very discrete parts of it, and it's not that. Um, so if you, 9-11, uh, we talked about uh, the, most of the hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. You focus solely on Saudi Arabia, we're missing a big part of, of the equation where uh, a lot of people are trained in Pakistan. And then if you expand out of that, you have similar, it's an ideological movement. Mm -hmm. So wherever people that are susceptible to that ideology exists, you'll find um, support for it. And that's why if you look at Osama bin Laden, he traveled from point to point and he was able to do that because of the fact that there were support in Africa, in uh, Afghanistan, in Pakistan. Um, so we need to realize this is a much broader problem than we usually credit it. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also talked a little bit about sometimes we focus too much on the symptoms. You know, how important do you guys think some of the underlying tenets of Islam or really any belief system are in shaping people's behavior? You know, do we need to focus more on that? I think that we've really lost the plot when we you know, try and separate uh, jihadism um, or Islamism in general from the religion of Islam. I think I, under I understand why we feel the need to do it to protect Muslims, the everyday Muslim who isn't going to you know, blow anyone up and just wants to go about living their lives. But uh, well intentioned it may be, it's still harmful in the way that we have come to understand Islamism and jihadism. And I I don't think that if you if you take it out of the equation altogether, you really can't make um, heads or tails out of why someone would be motivated to do what they're doing. Okay, can you guys talk about the the background conservatism in Islam? Because I think a lot of again for you know a liberal in America, if we think about our religious right, that's sort of one set of parameters. I remember talking probably a couple of years ago how Islamic conservatism goes way past what we assume it does. So one no. Uh, point uh, regarding gay, gay rights. Um, Muslims in America are regarded as the most liberal in the world, and their positions largely align with the most conservative Christians in America. So that's the most liberal subset you have. Um, if you look at countries uh, like Egypt, which is the largest Arab country, um, a high majority of them are against gay rights, and the same exists with apostates. And so um, it's an inversion where the vast majority of people believe uh, in dogmatic, have dogmatic certainty, and believe that their religion is perfect and accurate, and uh, and that is the only path to uh, salvation. So um, one of the things we need to be doing is. Eliminating the dogmatic certainty. If you have, if you don't have certainty, you're not willing to take it to the next level. You're not willing to take somebody else's life. Um, but that isn't being addressed at all. And, and I think you guys live this constantly and swim in it, so you're very aware of it. For people that haven't sort of followed the whole discussion, what actually happens to apostates and gay people and women that violate the rules under like you know Islamic theocracies? Well, I mean. If you look, through, a lot of people say it's a kind of a kind of a joke among some you know Muslim groups that I've I've 
been you know poking around in, especially online, where they say, you know, well, ex-Muslims say this, all, all 10 ex-Muslims, because they really think that there's so few of us. And the reason they think that is because it, most of us do not speak out. Most of us do not uh, we're not honest with the outside world about who we are because of what we fear would happen to us. And sometimes it's in the West, for example, it's not always, you know, you're not going to worry about the state persecuting you, but you have a lot to fear with losing family support, losing your friends, losing your social circles. And people don't, I think, understand how high of a price that is to pay. Um, you know, so a lot of people aren't willing to pay it just for you know, a little bit of intellectual honesty. So it sort of puts ex-Muslims in this difficult position where you have something to lose if you're being honest and something to lose if you're not being honest. Uh, to add to that, um, there's a second order effect. A lot of people are willing to stand up and uh, may speak up for issues that they're passionate about. But I'm willing to put myself on the line, for example. Um, are you willing to put your parents on the line? So the right. is, there's second order effects where your entire family is ostracized, your entire family is threatened. And we have people who uh, sp sp who've spoken up publicly and their families have been threatened with violence. Um, and then you have the uh, issue of family members, even if the state isn't persecuting the family members directly, threatening people. Um, one of uh, our members is from Saudi Arabia. His dad threatened to kill him, pointed a gun at his head, and um, when he came out as an atheist, his mother intervened and he ran away. Hasn't seen his father since. So things like that are very real occurrences. Mm -hmm. Right. There was, um, <clears throat> I think it was Friedrich Niemöller, was a Lutheran pastor that favored Hitler in the beginning and then fell out of favor. Um, and you know, he ended up, this sort of an amalgam of his quotes, but you know, first they came for the communists, I wasn't a communist, so I didn't speak up. And they came for the socialists, and they came for the Jews. Um, you know, and then when they came for me, nobody was left to speak out. How do you, and so that speaks to what you guys are talking about, how you know, that may not be directed at you for a moment, but how, how do you guys get the whole broad community to understand if everybody doesn't come out at the same time, then every person that pokes their head up is really risking their life and their livelihood and their family. Do you guys have any way to get around that? There is no easy way to get around that. That's one of the reasons we started the organization, to get enough people. Because once you have a lot of people around you that are of the same perspective, then you get a lot more courage. And we have seen that a lot more. We've been around about three years now. And you, if you go online and look up uh, the amount of experts that are speaking up publicly three years ago versus now, there's a massive difference. And a lot of the people that we work with are doing podcasts now, are doing their own videos, are writing regularly. So simply uh, having a sense of community, having the idea that I'm not the only one, there are a lot of other people, and I, I have the power to make change happen. Mm -hmm. um, that creates a massive difference. Yeah, I mean, those on the front lines, I think, have the most to lose, but the more of us that step in into the fray, the less there is um, danger for any particular person and the less any one person has to lose. Now, do you think um, there's a divide between uh, people, Westerners, coming to the aid of those marginalized by religion uh, with, within the Eastern countries versus Westerners coming to the aid of religion in general? So usually Westerners will, you know, those in America on the left will protect the religion of Islam from criticism uh, from the, you know, liberal and conservative ends, but they won't protect per se those living in an Islamic country being subjected to the Islamic laws against their will. Um, they're a little more quiet on that. What do you have to say about that? Um, for some reason, there's this conflation in the West where um, Islam is viewed as somebody's primary identity, like their uh, race, and that is immutable, and that is very, very harmful. Um, so if we're criticizing religion, we're viewed as sort of a, a fifth column, and we've been called various racial epithets regarding that. because the natural state of people that are from our part of the world is supposed to be religious. And therefore, they're not willing, people that should be our natural allies are not willing to stand up and talk about these issues. Um, <coughs> in, uh, we were talking about apostasy and the consequences of that. About 14 countries um, instituted the death penalty for apostasy. Now, if you invert that, if there was any other uh, group where 14 countries, say in Europe, were saying these people of this background shall be killed, what would the reaction of the Western left? Would they be, yeah, okay, fine. That would never, ever happen. And that is the case in the 21st century. Right, it's such an enormous double standard, and the, the people doing that are, are we liberals. You know, like, lots of us have, for many years, had problems with people on the far right. But, you know, you guys, I know you've spoken about this before, one of the biggest challenges you face is getting your fellow liberals to see why speaking out is important. Right. Um, 
w what would you say about people like Reza Aslan, who presents himself as a scholar, you know, and Glenn Greenwald? What kind of harm are they doing to the individual Muslim people by, you know, taking their by attacking people that are also trying to help? Well, I think there's there's been a, a group of people, some Western, very privileged Muslims, uh, Muslims who uh, haven't found their experience to be very difficult, and they sort of are speaking on behalf of everyone else and saying that, well, we don't actually have any problems at all, and a lot of them, there's a, sort of a common tre a trend to say that the problems aren't within the religion, it's within, you know, some misinterpretations of the religion and uh, various ways that, you know, you can blame the West for the problems of um, Muslim majority countries and it's it's a it's a red herring and it's one of those things that just presents another hurdle for us to cross before we can get to addressing what really should be uh, very obvious because it's it's in front of our faces we don't really need to look very far people can just pick up a Quran look one up online read it themselves and see what's there uh, but they they're presenting you know other hurdles for us to to, to cross so it's become um, this battle where instead of going directly towards the Islamists and confronting the Islamists, people like us are instead having to first say, no, there really is a problem, and it really does have to do with the religion. Stuff that really should be obvious. And, oh, go ahead. Um, if in the first century, seventh century, seventh century BC, whatever, um, I talk about any individual, and that was the beginner, that person initiated feminism. Um, I would be laughed out of, the, out of the room. If any other religious group was talking about that, I, I would similarly be laughed out of the room. Muslims say outrageous things like that all the time, and they're taken seriously, and that is a problem. These are common sense issues that anybody can dismiss out of hand. Nobody in the seventh century was against slavery, was campaigning against slavery. Muhammad was pro-slavery, for example. That, that was the norm in that time. If anybody's saying anything against that, we can dismiss it out of hand, but for some reason, um, when people like Raza Aslan say that they're actively acknowledged and it's accepted that that could possibly be true. Right. Do, do you think that's in part like our media is so illiterate with, with these you know, like broader concepts or that they're just out there to make a buck as part of the capitalist system and the more controversy that you stir up? You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how that gained traction you know, in educated people. I think part of it is wishful thinking. I think that people want to see Islam as being uh, this this nice, friendly religion, but it, it it isn't. And we have to be able to we have to be able to talk about the ways in which it isn't, and you know work. We work towards reforming those ways to till we get to a more friendly Islam. So I think that part of it, I think, is protecting the the small brown man. And I've I've been talking about this for quite some time, but I do think it's a little bit of a racist um, narrative too to say that well their religion is nicer and their religion is you know uh, different than how we have experienced our religion in the past. Um, it's funny because it's even all you have to do is look at. Christianity in in the past couple of centuries to see how bad religion can get, mm -hmm. but they're unwilling to do that um, and acknowledge that in the case of Islam. And I don't know if either of you have um, read or heard um, recently ISIS published um, in their newsletter. I guess they have a regular <laughs> newsletter. Um, the reasons why they hate the West, and so one of them was they stated that even if we pulled out our troops from everywhere around the world and stopped bombing every Muslim country they would still attack us because it's not about that. Although that's important, it's about the religion. Until every person has kneeled to Islam, but they they're, so, they're so clear. They're yeah. so clear about <laughs> about what they're what they want, but no one's believing them. And then when people like me, I've, I mean, I've been accused of this multiple times, that I'm actually aiding people like the Taliban and Al Qaeda and ISIS because I say that their interpretation of Islam has some logic behind it. Like it's 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 in some way reasonable to see Islam the way that they see it, um, based on what is written. And because of this, I'm I'm on their side, which is uh, this non sense thing. And it goes back to the bigotry angle that um, for certain kinds of people, what they're saying doesn't matter. We know better. And you, what you're saying couldn't really be true. We will tell you what is actually true. And that right. for any other race, that, that would never fly. But for some reason with Islam, it's okay. Has that, so I think right after 9-11, a lot of people started to get the Quran and they were interested in like, this culture just attacked, what, what's this about? Has that made your job any easier? Like, are more people reading and saying, oh, it really does say all these dangerous things in here, or people didn't pursue it enough and, and it's still as much of a problem as it was 15 years ago? 
Um, in my opinion, this is as much of a, pro a problem. The other aspect is that a lot of people are writing things that are defending it and um, misinterpreting the content. Of, um, there are a uh, litany of authors that have come out about the wonders of Islam, the wonders of Muhammad, and mm -hmm. um, they're willing to outright change what it says. Um, there's a feminist uh, that translated the Quran and um, the feminist interpretation of the Quran or something like that. And um, she's admitted this in the New York Times that when she was translating the verse from the Quran where it talks about beating women, um, she knew that God could not mean that. So she spent like six months trying to find an alternative interpretation <laughs> until she found an interpretation that felt right to her. And then she wrote that down. It's sort of like saying the Jefferson Bible supports Christianity, I guess, where he cut out all the supernatural stuff because yeah. he didn't buy it. Yeah, so what's interesting is that truth is truth is lost, and it's just competing two competing narratives, and then we have to try and find some you know objective standard to look at to really face the problem. But you have to sort of wade through all this these feelings and various narratives that are you know I think politically motivated. Do you think in, in skeptical groups and with critical thinkers? Does that help? Or I mean, I know you still face challenges even within that community. Is that, is that an easier, easier audience that they eventually get what you're talking about and then they're trying to support you? It's the most welcome that we are anywhere. But that's not to say that I think necessarily we're welcome. Um, but I, I think people that come from extremist backgrounds that aren't uh, Muslims, or that aren't from Muslim backgrounds, get a better reception than somebody like us. So if uh, Mormons came, ex-Mormons came on the scene, and they were talking about Mormonism the way we talk about Islam, I think it would be accepted better than um, our version, even within skeptic, skeptic communities. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is the best that we get, is sort of, at least people are willing to consider what we have to say. Right, and we had the person that founded it, uh I'm an ex-Mormon, is their group, um, and they certainly had a lot of resistance within the Mormon community, but I didn't get the sense of outside of the Mormon community that they were vilified in the same way that you guys you know, are sometimes. Um, you also mentioned something called the Daoud Affair, or you talked about the author. Can you tell us what that's about? So that, that was very interesting and disconcerting. Can you tell us what that's all about? Um, well, there's this, uh, I think he's Algerian, I think, French-Algerian author named Kamel Daoud. And he has been writing for quite some time. He's politically left. Um, and he wrote a piece for Le Monde, I believe. And it was about uh, the clone attacks, uh, sexual assaults that happened on New Year's Eve. And maybe just say what that is, because a lot of people aren't as familiar with you. With well, what that was. Uh, it was just a, a mass a sexual assault that happened on New Year's Eve um, at, I guess, uh, around party goer time, and people uh, went out, and gangs of men approached women, and there were just uh, assaults on a scale that, you know, is really just very, very disconcerting, at, at least. Um, and so people were trying to make sense of what this was and what happened, and he wrote a piece uh, about it, and he talked about how, on the one hand, um, immigrants are often looked at as the, the other and vilified in unfair ways, but on the other, um, some French people are unwilling to recognize that there is a different world out there and that the Arab Muslim world has different values and that those different values need to be, um, need to be addressed and need to be, when you're talking about immersion of different uh, immigrant populations, you can't just give them uh, you know, material goods and then expect everything to be okay. You also have to um, stand up for your values and persuade them with your values and to join you there. Otherwise, you're going to have this the, the sort of thing we saw at in, in New Year's Eve. Um, so when he wrote this, he was just, uh, I think he was addressed with just, there was a, a flood of uh, attacks against him, calling him an Islamophobe and a racist and a bigot and adding to uh, vilification of Muslims, um, so much so that he, he said that he was no longer going to participate in journalism altogether because he was so disheartened by what he thought was you know, just a fair opinion that he was giving. And I think this is a, uh, it's very telling. And I think it's very much, uh, it, it's, it, it is like the essence of what the problem is at the moment, where we really cannot talk about the fact that people have different values. And we have to be able to say that certain values, enlightenment values, are, are, are better, are treat people fairer, are more humane, and we have to be able to stand up for them. Right, right. I guess the whole idea of you know, this multiculturalism where everything is relativistic, and so if you beat a woman or kill a gay person, that's your culture, and I can't comment on it, that, that's so destructive. I don't understand how we're still trapped in that and not able to get past it. Um, 
Jason and I actually met um, during in, in Richmond. There was a talk on feminism and atheism. And so one of the presenters, in, in the space of one sentence, you know, smeared Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, David Silverman, and Michael Shermer. Um, and then I, you know, I said something about it, and he did. You know, and then that's how we met. So maybe you can talk about the regressive left a little more, because this seemed like such the perfect example and so disheartening that hopefully this person doesn't leave journalism, but if he does, it's not because he couldn't take Fox News, Fox News having a platform, it's because the progressives. So, so tell us about the regressive left. Well, um, it's, it's one of those things where I think politics has a lot to do with it, and political positioning has a lot to do with how the left has chosen to confront Islam, which is to say that because the religious Christian right is against uh, Muslims um, for all these wrong reasons, mm -hmm. um, and possibly xenophobic reasons, then we should protect Muslims no matter what, and we should um, uh, shield them from attacks no matter what. But this is, of course, ignoring the reality of the world, where there's so much more complicated, which is to say that there can be victims in one, in one sense. There can be a group of people that are victims in one sense, but also victimizing others in various ways. And we need to be able to call out both. But people are failing to do this. And they're failing to uh, cons consider this in the, you know, the very complicated and, and uh, various, I guess, it's you know it's one of those things that it's it's very very difficult to approach fairly and objectively because there's a lot of emotions that are going around and a lot of people's identities are involved and it's become toxic to talk about things where people people's identities are involved. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so well, good. Regressive to me is too nice of a term. Um, there are actually bigots from my perspective. Um, you're viewing another culture differently and you're not willing to put them on the same standard as you. And you're tolerating behavior they would never tolerate that for yourself. And you're not willing to have those uh, same criticisms that you apply to other groups to this group. That is, holding people to different standards is the de definition of bigotry. Um, regardless of whether it's coming from a benevolent uh, place, mm -hmm. that it is paternalistic, I, I know better. Um, so we need to, in my opinion, call, start calling that out. Like, we often talk about xenophobia on the right, and it's, it is a huge issue. But the mirror image of that paternalistic big bigotry on the left is equally a, an issue. Yeah, I don't, I don't think people get that, that it really has become that serious of an issue. I saw you guys link to a, an article from um, your website that defends the use of the term regressive left because I think we're sensitive as liberals to the fact that people can label somebody just to dismiss them, and so we're hesitant to do that. But it's actually a very apt term, and it captures something that the progressives are ignoring, that um, it really is causing a lot of harm and making the work of reformers infinitely harder. Um, so I you know, appreciate you guys. I'm just talking about that. Um, do you have anything to add about it? Uh, um, I was just going to, I don't know how often you get this, but I hear a lot of times people say, well, Christianity has a lot of bad things in the scripture. Or, and so they use that to justify anything bad that happens in Islam. Uh, do you guys get that a lot? Yes. Okay. Um, the, the issue is, so the apt comparison is like 14th century Christianity and modern day Islam. Because uh, the reason all those things happened back then was people took their Bible very seriously, their priests very seriously, they were willing to fight and die for that, they were willing to kill for that. And that is largely where the Muslim world exists today. They're willing to, they, they have such level of certainty in their scripture that they're willing to take lives over that. And most, not all, but most of the Christian world has moved past that for centuries they've been pushed and been told about why these things are wrong and our the western civilization to a great extent has internalized that so for you have to be able to you have to say that either all Christ, all religions are good in some way or all religions are equally bad yeah. and to say anything in between is considered a form of bigotry and that's just it's it's one of those things that makes honest dialogue impossible because of course they're not all exactly the same of course their impact on the world is not all exactly the same because they come from different contexts there's different history surrounding it and and you know uh, centuries of law and interpretation and all this stuff that's that's different and that means that they have a different impact on the world and we have to be able to talk about it but that's uh, I, f I found that I have to either say with every breath that I condemn Islam I have to also say also Christianity is terrible I have to say this otherwise I'm unfairly targeting yeah. 
So, so I, th I think our inability to have honest conversations you know, is just becoming such an enormous problem. Um, Mohammed, we've talked about this before, but what is that failure on the left to just address honestly what's going on in the political realm? How is that helping authoritarian governments or right-wing governments take over? And do you guys think that's playing into our current election cycle in America? Yes, it definitely is. Um, it's a lack of trust. If, if I'm being dishonest to you and you figure out that I'm a dis for whatever reasons, the uh, amount of trust you'll bestow upon me is much lower. And the leftist politicians, um, Obama has repeated the line that Islam is a religion of peace, which is has nothing to do with Islam whatsoever. Um, it's more of a slogan. Um, and a lot of people are repeating those same lines that they talk about Islamophobia um, instead of anti-Muslim bigotry, which is a very different thing. Um, and therefore, people can't see what's going on in the world. And whoever they perceive as addressing the actual issue, mm -hmm. uh, they'll gravitate towards that person. And you see that across the West. You see that in, uh, <clears throat> in France, in Germany, with the current election cycle over here. And um, it's a failure of the left to address the actual issue. Right, and they, it opens the door, it seems, for like demagogues that people don't really trust, but at least they're being honest about this one situation. Um, can you talk about the, you know, what we talk about, like the political terrorism becomes very obvious if somebody flies, you know, a uh, plane into a building. So talk about the stuff that goes on on the inside. I mean, we've touched on this a little bit, but if you guys had to give a list of these are the major harms, you know, the stifling effect of Islam, um, what, what are some of the harms that the West doesn't talk about at all that we should be? You know, aside from we've talked about, like, you know, just gay people being thrown off, but what are some of the more subtle things and educational things, I guess? I think just the... Um what, what Muhammad touched on this a little bit earlier about how there's there's a very different understanding of truth and uh, reli religious truth especially uh, the level of certainty that Muslims have towards the truth of the of the Quran is as if uh, you know we were in the Catholic Church in you know the 14th 15th centuries I mean it's they are a hundred percent certain that this is the truth and this has a severe impact on how they study science and it's become very difficult for um, scientists and and you know, even professors at, at universities around, across the Muslim world to discuss um, scientific facts that may not be completely in line with, with the Quran. And especially, I, I'm more familiar with the case in, in, in Pakistan. But I know that it's been very difficult for scientists and professors of science to talk about things like geology that may not be 100% in line with, with what Islam says <laughs> about it. And so that's, I think that's something that people don't, you know, it gets brushed under the, under the rug because because terrorism is so in your face, it's so, you know, it's visceral, it's bloody, uh, we can't help but stare at that. But there's uh, various effects, um, you know, ripple effects that this religion has throughout uh, the Muslim world that are really hindering its progress. And I guess if you dismiss, you know, the, the female half of the population, you've immediately gotten rid of an enormous just talent pool for all, every aspect of society. Um, um, if you're not advancing in science, if you're not creating things, that in the modern economy you don't have anything. And most Muslim countries aren't doing that be simply because of the fact they don't believe, really believe in science. They don't understand science. They don't, um, they're willing to alter the curricula to accommodate religion. Um, in Pakistan, I, I grew up in Pakistan. Um, evolution isn't really taught. There's a two paragraph section talking about evolution is uh, something that the West believes and so on and so forth. And before that, there are a couple of lines talking about the Quran and after they're talking about the Quran, that this is what we know to be true and Adam and Eve and so on and so forth. So if you don't understand basics like that, how can you, create something groundbreaking in biology that you can market to the world and get revenue from. So if there's nothing that besides natural resources like oil that the Muslim world can sell the rest of the world, of course they're going to be impoverished. Of course there's going to be all these secondary issues. We often talk about poverty being a huge issue. But why is there that much poverty over there that isn't in other parts of the world? I think um, Dowd in one of his articles mentioned that uh, one of the problems is that they invest in the afterlife more than they do this life, and that's oh. why. Um, there was an article today um, about um, tomorrow is uh, uh, Eid al-Adha, which is the celebration of Abraham at attempting to murder his kid. <laughs> um, and as a part of that, the Muslims are supposed to ki kill an animal, like a goat, a cow, so on and so forth, a sacrifice. And um, they talked about uh, uh, Pakistan is a very poor country. It's one of the ten poorest or so. Um, they're going to be spending about $2 billion sacrificing animals. And imagine that money being invested instead into education. 
um, as a part of that whole ritual, um, people fly into Saudi Arabia to the most holy place, Mecca, um, and perform a religious ceremony called the Hajj. And um, last year in Bangladesh, which was also an extremely poor country, um, one of the foreign ministers was talking about the fact that we need to be educated, investing in education. We spend so much money sending our people there for religious reasons. If we just reinvested the money in education, it would help the country so much. Um, within two days, he had to resign. Within four days, he had to leave the country. Yeah, that's the the very weak parallel here in the United States is you know we have the whole alter alternative uh, medicine branch of the National Institutes of, of Health and the vitamin industry so we siphon away you know thirty to sixty billion dollars away from that kind of research but then like when you look at it and so we can see that you know skeptics see that as a real problem here and we'll speak against it but when you have an impoverished country and you take the tiny tidbits that they have and pull that away too it's devastating it just I guess traps them in this permanent cycle. Um, and when you speak up, you're either killed or you have to run away from the country. Right, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. So, I mean, it's just important to get this message out, exactly how bleak it is, because I think people that aren't doing what you guys do and aren't swimming in the community, it's very easy to just notice a headline, move on, and not realize that the 1.6 billion Muslims are really suffering under this, you know, ideology. Um, I did want to, we were going to talk about 9-11, um, so I just want to get back to that a little bit. Are, are there some places that you feel we've made progress? I mean, and maybe the answer is no, but um. <laughs> my perspective is no. Um, Sarah so may defer, but um, generally we've been uh, looking at it as a military issue, and we're uh, uh, attacking countries where military action won't solve an ideological problem. Um, the dogmatic certainty that people have still exists, and um, Saudi Arabia and other religious countries are spending a lot of money trying to amp up that religiosity, and they are succeeding. Every single country, if you look at look at what it was pre 9/11 and what it is today, they become more and more religious, and we. We've been losing the battle throughout. Well, I mean, I, I think it's generally it it hasn't improved in a lot of ways. In some ways, it's gotten worse. But I think that I do see a hope in you know at, at least apostates speaking up, being more. Um, feeling like they can speak up. At least the internet, I think, makes it possible to be anonymous. There's quite a few anonymous um, apostate bloggers and, and people who make videos and they, they talk about uh, Islam and criticize Islam. And I think that's just the heart of the matter, is that you need to uh, take away that certainty and plant just a little bit of doubt and then we'll just open the floodgates to uh, you know just various ways that the Muslim world can improve. So that's helpful and that's slowly starting to, to show up, so hopefully uh, it'll have an impact. Is there anything that the West can do? So I think if, if safety concerns were addressed, that could let things happen a lot quicker, but is, is there any feasible way that you guys see that the West can help make things safer for you know, Muslims that want to leave religion, or does that strictly have to come from within these countries that are dead set against it? It'll be a bit of both. So we can apply a lot of econo economic pressure on these countries. The 14 countries, as I mentioned, have apostasy laws. What are the consequences of that? There, there's no consequence. If you have, uh, you don't have the separation of church and state, what is the consequence of that? There's no international pressure to change these norms. Um, and the West can do a lot for, about that. The West can also invest a lot in education in those countries and over here. And we can invest in uh, researching Islam in academia. That will make a huge difference. We know, for example, with the Bible that there are four authors and there's been a centuries of research done into b biblical history and biblical criticism. Mm -hmm. We can invest in academia where they do the same for the Quran and for Islamic history. Most of Islamic history was written centuries later. It's not true. But we don't have solid research being done on that because the left doesn't want to do it and in Muslim countries you obviously can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, it, it's surprisingly poor how how uh, the academics the status of how much we know about about Islam and how much the the um, you know universities are really looking into this religion and and, and the culture because I think there's been a fear of uh, being a racist being uh, labeled an Orientalist that has really stunted um, any kind of inquiry into it that may be critical at all and that's definitely what is needed right now but it's it's not happening if anything there every time I look into it about you know literature um, it, about, uh, that has to do with Islam a lot of it is sounds like apologism to me right. so there's obviously no hesitancy to do that exact same kind of scriptural analysis on Christianity right. to see that yeah and we don't just have four gospels by four people we've got you know all these <laughs> authors that are undocumented um, you know who did what doing it for political agendas yeah. mm -hmm. um, so d does that technique work any better with progressives to say, do you guys realize this is being 
bigoted by you not even letting us look into this? Like, is that a way? You, it seems like you need some way to hook into the progressives to make to open their eyes that they're causing harm. Because it usually probably does come from a good place for most of them. It doesn't matter whether it's coming from a good place. The road to hell is paved with good. No, no, I, I understand exactly how harmful I'm saying, but it would like so. I think some people that are eager to be bigots aren't going to care what you say. I think a lot of the progressives if they sort of realized how harmful their approach is, they might have that aha moment and then suddenly support what you're doing. If they realize it, yes. But usually they also have a lot of apologists, Muslims on the other side, calling us bigots. So them being receptive to our conversation is rare. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to get to another thing that we talked about ahead of time. I think that the media's coverage of terrorism is really damaging because we'll plaster it on the air constantly and so people think all these Muslims are terrible and they think our terror is here as my number one, two, three problems, you know, global warming we'll worry about later. You brought up another a counterpoint. So if the media downplayed what's going on, which in some cases it has, what, what's the consequence of that? Well, the, the media will lose credibility, and I think it, that's already begun. Like we, we can we can already sense it, and I've I've sensed it with people that are unwilling to believe what the media has to say when it comes to Islam. And I know that this is happening all across Europe, and I see this increasingly happening when it comes to Islam. It's a very it's a it's a difficult thing to do. But the media's job is to report what's happening, what the facts are, and not try and coax the people into feeling one way or another. Um, that's the job of people who you know maybe the pundit class, but people who are interpreting this and, and they have opinions and they say, okay, well, it, all these things are happening, this is how we should best approach it. But it's not the media's job to suppress uh, actual news because they feel like it might have a harmful effect. Is there any place that you guys do turn to for reliable news, or is it just personal contacts? Like, is there any place that we should go if we're trying to get accurate information? Um. I don't think so. Um, as you said, personal contacts and um, multiple sources, things like that. But um, a lot of news is filtered and reported days late, depending upon what's going on. Um, one of the issues that, in my opinion, is that people are concerned about that if we talk about this too much, um, it will demonize Muslims. There's a difference between talking about this ideology being bad versus saying people are bad. We can draw a distinction between a bad idea and people being bad. So uh, communism was bad. Are all Russians bad? No, of course not. And for some reason, we can't make that. We're unable to make that distinction with Islam. Most Muslims are inherently good people, but this ideology is a toxic ideology, and we need to fight fight it. I think that's part. That's because of the the racism. That's that Muslims are inherently religious, and religion is a is a deep. It's an essential part of their being. And because it's an essential part, then if you criticize a religion, you criticize a, a part of them that that can never be changed, and so you're harming them in some way. Which is, I think, it's a racist way of looking yeah. at Muslims. <laughs> Are there any lessons to be learned from, so like black non-believers is a community here, you know, in, in African American community, religion is astronomically high. And so for a black person to walk away from that is very challenging. And they also get targeted the same way that you guys do, that they're nativists, they're you know, traitors to their race and that kind of stuff. H have you had any interaction with any of leaders in that community? Is there any, any lessons that you can take from there? Um, well, there's quite a bit of similarities, but I do think that our case is a little bit more extreme sometimes than what uh, than what uh, maybe black non-believers do. But there are a lot of uh, similarities, especially the what you were saying that you were perceived as a traitor to your people. So we get you know Uncle Tom uh, is is thrown at us a house house Muslim, mm -hmm. um, which is you know a play on another derogatory st slur. So there's um, a lot of the same similarities there. Um. Um, Sorry. Sorry. Um, to add to that, a lot of these people are from respectable um, institutions. So uh, one person, for example, Nathan Lean, has said horrible things like that. He targets ex-Muslims. Um, he was paid by Georgetown University. Um, there are tons of people like that in, across universities in America that are on the left that are horribly racist. And it's accepted and it's OK because they're racist towards certain individuals like us. So you'd also mentioned critical thinking you know, skills are probably what we need to get injected into society to really eventually help fix these problems. Is there any path to doing that from the outside or the inside? Is there any movement to do that? Or is that something that religion is very purposely going to keep shut down? I think, I mean, from my perspective, Islamic criticism has 
that that is the key. That has to happen. That has to happen forcefully. That has to happen regularly. And that has to be seen across the board. It's something that is unheard of in for most Muslims. That you can even have a legitimately good criticism of of Islam. Most most Muslims are just they've never heard of such a thing. Most Christians have heard of different religions. Most Christians have heard of atheism. At least they know the existence of them, which in itself is a little bit uh, is something that gives you a little bit of doubt sometimes. This is not the case with the Muslim world at all. So I think that when we're talking about narratives and whether we should report something or not, we're missing the plot. And what really needs to happen is that we need to uh, be able to look at the scriptures, we need to look at the practices, and we need to say that this is immoral. Um, one other thing is that if you look at communism, America invests a lot in media, um, Voice of America, and alternative ways of getting information out there. We haven't done that with this problem. Um, also, regarding communication, regarding education, I left Islam because of uh, my scientific back education. Um, I read Sagan, I love Sagan. Um, we can create similar programs where we uh, target local populations and try to scientifically educate them. There's no other agenda, just bring up the scientific consciousness in various countries. That'll change things dramatically. But would that start with countries where it's less dangerous to do so? Like I'm just curious if there's a practical avenue that you see that we should begin exploring to try to get that education out there. Um, so we can support people that are doing it already. Parviz Hoodboy in Pakistan um, runs videos online. He's a nuclear physicist. There are various other people in various countries. We can support them. Alternatively, aid can be tied to that. There are a lot of, lots of things that the government can do. We're going to uh, spend a certain amount of money ed for education, and it must be ed people must be educated in these five fields. So we just have a few minutes left. Are there any any parting messages that you want to uh, people should be thinking about? Um, ways that we can all help as individuals, or ways that the you know secular community can help. Well, I would ask um, the secular community to uh, look for ways that we can be as intellectually honest as possible. And I don't think that this is something that uh, it, it is, people think that it is the inverse of compassion, but, but it isn't, and it doesn't have to be. And they can go hand in hand, and in this case, they really do if you think about the issues. So I think we should, we should press for that. And especially for the long run, even, even if you say something that short term is hurtful, if it's actually the truth and it lets people adjust their ways, that is a much better long term. Uh, that is a compassionate that way. Have. That's a compassionate view. If you're a family member or somebody you care about was going in a, a direction that is completely divorced from reality, mm -hmm. would intervening that in that and talk, talking to them about reality, not pushing them, not anything, um, would that be a good thing or not? With your own family, everybody would say, yeah, of course I'm going to intervene. I'm just my family with somebody I care about. Why is it different when it's somebody else? It's the same issue. We need to talk honestly about these problems. Um, so, uh, sorry, going back to 9-11, one of the things that I would like to emphasize is the fact that until and unless we reduce dogmatic certainty that Muslims have, things will not change. After 9-11, we were targeting Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, and we were going to eliminate them, eradicate them. ISIS wasn't on our radar. That showed up 10 years later. Um, if you keep going back, every decade we talk about what the problem is, and it continuously keeps getting worse, not better. Um, the only way to eliminate that is to uh, eliminate the oxygen from where these guys are coming, and that is by eliminating the certainty they have regarding their religion. Mm -hmm. And is there anything that you would say about, and I've always found it funny that the religious right here, you know, the Christians that are eager for the Jews to you know, go up in flames in Armageddon, how they've partnered together politically. Um, how, how does that work with Islam? Like, is the religious right more of a partner in seeing the evil? Like, how, how do you work with them? Or do you just stay away? Because I've seen some of the people that will combat Islam are the ones I consider the most bigoted in the country. I don't work with them. Um, not to say that, but I won't, I won't say, deny that sometimes that they are correct in their understanding of, of Islam, and they can be. Um, nothing about them being Christian means that they can't see it for what it is, and maybe something about it means that they are more able to see it clearly. Um, so I won't deny when they're correct, but I don't work with them directly because our aims are different. Um, same, but also we've been approached about a hundred times more by people from that faction than from the left, right. and that is very telling. And we've had to say we've we've said no multiple mm -hmm. times, but we uh, that is who we get approached by. That those are the people that show interest in what we have to say. Right. And that's what I said. I remember with Ayan uh, Hirsi Ali when she was literally in fear for her life. The only place in the United States that would help her out were the 